Good afternoon. Um, I'm Ron Painter, and I'm uh, the CEO for something called the National Association of Workforce Boards. There are about 500 local business-led workforce boards across the, across the U.S. and the territories. Uh, workforce boards work across the issues of education and what you call workforce development, looking at uh, not only all the way from PK through what um, seniors, and I'll admit, I'm probably in that category. I won't indict anyone else. Um, you know, what happens when, when not only we're trying to enter the labor market, what happens when we're in the, inter, in the labor market making transitions, um, and what happens when we're struggling to get back into the labor market? I think one of the things that I'll, I'll quickly point out before I introduce the panel, we were going to talk about employers' expectations and, and where we are. I think one of the things that, that happens, and I'll do a little test with the audience, and I, we're recording. So I apologize to the folks who are watching the recording. They, they can't see. But how many of you walked into a room and got hired in, in a room this size with this number of people in the room, like 30, 40 people? One person did. OK. How many of you went into a room and got hired yourself, by yourself? Got it? OK. Right? That's how we get it done. And so lots of times when we think about the U.S. labor market, the, our perception is somewhat distorted because we see the market and we see this hiring, transition, separation, quitting as, as a singular event. It's something that happens to us or it's something that happened to our neighbor or we ascribe it to, to one person. Last month in the U.S. labor market, there were about 5.4 million hires. 5.4 million people got hired about 5.1 million people separated from their job for a variety of reasons. And at the end of the month, there were about 5 million, 5.4 million jobs that were vacant. It's an amazingly dynamic labor market. And so workforce boards get to look at that market and try to figure out who's in it, who's not, and what kind of skills are, are being required. So I have an amazing panel um, to, to join us. We were. Um, we get to hang out a lot together, so this is, this is really pretty good. Good or bad. Good or bad, that's right. Let me go left to right. Uh, Jamae Bliven is the CEO for Innovate Educate, which is, I'm going to let her explain a little bit about it as I go down. Phil Blair is the executive, for, executive officer for Manpower here in San Diego and a number of other locations. And Peter Kalstrom is the CEO, president and CEO for the San Diego Workforce Partnership, which is... Uh, the workforce board here for, for San Diego. So, Jamee, let me kick it off and we can, probably the last question, we just go down, the, go down the row. So, part of what, a lot of what we want to talk about is employer demand. Mm -hmm. So, I want you to tell us a little bit about what you guys do at Innovate Educate, Manpower, and, and the partnership, but talk about it, then talk about it in terms of what does employer demand mean, mean to you? And, you can talk about it, obviously, from the different perspectives. So, Jamee, tell us a little about Innovate Educate and, and this whole notion of demand. Okay. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us late when there's cocktail parties and things <laughs> happening. Um, so, Innovate Educate is a national nonprofit. We're located in Santa Fe, New Mexico. We're working in seven cities right now, and, and we exist to create new employment pathways across the country based on skills and competencies. So everything we're doing, everything in our portfolio of funded investments, uh, mostly funded by foundations, is focused on the shift. The shift from employer demand, from requiring four-year degrees, five years of experience, big barriers, to getting employers to look at competencies and skills. We say we're demand driven. So when we talk about employer demand, we're working across all of these cities, specifically with the employer piece, trying to understand why they're asking for what they're asking. Do they know why they're asking for it in the first place? How do they measure those skills? And then how do you provide those candidates working with the workforce boards that are our lead partners in all of these cities to then understand how that employer demand impacts education and training. So that's what employer demand uh, is to us. Literally, what is the employer asking for? But we don't stop there. Then we question the employer, do they even know what they mean? Because we think the employers 
May, may not. Phil can, <laughs> Phil can argue Speaking with that. Of the devil. <laughs> Phil is it. <a>, <laughs> He's an employer. Yeah. yeah. I mean, as a staff you, you know what you're doing. I get the mic after you do, so that's fine. <laughs> I may not get it at all. <laughs> well, yeah. no, no, no. I mean, that's my job, Peter, is to make sure you do that's get it. That's okay. <laughs> well, we're where the rubber hits the road. Does anybody understand what a temp not understand what a temporary help company does? Okay. When you talk about demand, our customers are calling us because they need somebody literally tomorrow with the right skills, with the right education, with the right experience, and the right attitude to fit into their corporate culture. Now, in 2015, we hired 13,000 people. So we do this constantly, right? And it's amazing how difficult it is often to make that match because employers' demands can be very unreasonable. And I'll, and I'll give you an example. During the recession, our customers would, would um, they need a receptionist for three months. And they'd say, you know, and I'd really like, and we would catch them, her, to have an MBA. And we'd go. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, isn't the customer always right? Mm -hmm. I don't want to, I mean, just Well, just ask. but the problem, the issue is they were right, and we would find them a receptionist with an MBA in 2009, 10, and 11, because there were so many people out of work that they would take a $12 an hour job in San Diego. Um, as a receptionist. But the, where the match is and why our industry is very interesting is that 42% of our temporaries get hired by our customers for a permanent job. So it's a wonderful way to take that match of somebody looking for work and someone that does nothing but fills thousands of orders every year and, and put them together. And yes, often we do have to work with our customers because they have unreasonable expectations because the job market has changed so much, as we all know, in the last two or three years. Unemployment in San Diego is 4.7. People say full employment's 5%. Uh, I talk to communities that it's 2% unemployment. So it's a whole different world, and we need to be very reasonable in our expectations for skills, education, and what we're willing to pay. And Jimmy, I have to agree, a lot of times in business, we are not reasonable about any or all of the above. Mm -hmm. I'm glad he recognizes that because he's on my board. He's my I, 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 I was just going to say, yeah, Peter, that, write that, that down? Phil, Phil here, we, we are both sort of, yeah, we, so Phil is on both of our boards. So, uh, yeah. We don't want him on we want to be very <laughs> We want to be very careful about the questions we ask, we ask <laughs> Phil. You know, she says it because now I'm going to beg to be on the board. <laughs> Uh, so at the Workforce Partnership, we're one of the 500 uh, to 550 workforce board uh, uh, around the country, uh, big, little, and small. We're one of the larger ones because we encompass the entire county of San Diego. Uh, our job is employer demand, understanding what our employers need. And I think that's been a real important and healthy uh, shift evolution of uh, workforce work uh, over the years and in the day back in the day it was uh, more of a train and pray model and and hope you know uh, the customer being the job seeker perhaps being more of the customer versus now uh, our customer is much more the employer so we have to understand what it is that our uh, employers in our region especially uh, need and want so that we can then align training programs that inform the job seeker so that they're going to get good jobs once they're done, once they go through our system. And when we have that focus on our employers in our ecosystem, which is all unique around the country, then we're beginning to do our job. Because when we do that again, then we can better leverage the limited resources we have from the federal government, the city, the county, and some of the private sector so that we properly inform the job seeker, number one, so that they're aware of what is even out there and that they make a good informed choice on their career that they understand who they are and what makes them tick what they really want to do versus feeling like they have to do a position that may not align with where they're coming from so our job is understanding employer demand in our region it's a it's a mega region 3.3 or 4 million people in San Diego County with a, a really diverse uh, group of sectors of, of industries we have three what we call traded economies 
the, the big moving economies that kind of drive everything else and are the bedrock of our region, and that's military as one, um, innovation sector and, uh, and um, technology as a second, and then hospitality. So three incredibly diverse bedrock um, sectors that then have laid the foundation for all the other other sectors that I'll talk about later that make up our region from life sciences to healthcare uh, and, and more. And our job again, understand it and properly inform the job seeker that they can, so that they can get um, what they want once they're, they go through our system. I think that's a really good, good point and I, I know that the three of you are not bashful. So you'll remind me if we don't come back to this question about labor market information and how much uh, we really think the, the job seeker, again, in, in those three different arenas, um, understand about that. But I want to come back to a point, Jamea, you made, and that is that oftentimes the employer doesn't really know what they want. So if you just accept that on the face of it, you're, you're going to be the passing train in the night. You're going to miss what they're asking for. How do you look at how do you determine what that really what that demand is and, and Phil I want to come back and ask you again as, as well that same thing how do you go back at your client and really get to an understanding of what they're looking for so you know labor market information is part of what we do so we literally pull the jobs and 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 we don't think that's perfect I mean Steve's here with us and our data science folks look at labor data all the time um, but at least you can pull jobs and then you say, did you know this is what your job posting says? And they go, oh, I didn't know that. Okay, good. You know, it says these are the skills and competencies you posted. You know, we've aggregated your postings. We're actually working with Los Alamos National Laboratory right now on their entry to mid-skilled jobs and pulling all of their job postings. And one HR person doesn't know what the H other HR person's doing, and they're asking for totally different skills. Sorry, Los Alamos, I'm glad you aren't here. Um, we'll send them a tape. Yeah. yeah, that's right, send them the tape, make sure um, they know. We're bonding. So like the entry level skills are not even transferable. So we start with looking at what they posted then, I think, all of the ways that you do employer job profiles are still archaic. Um, so we're looking at new ways to, to get to the competencies that the employers are doing. Just really quick, what we did in Dallas, which I loved and I was excited about, is we have two IRO psychologists on our team. We adopted the national retail competency model that was built through different foundations, the National Business Roundtable, 167 employers in retail and adjacent sectors that all agreed on a competency framework. Mm. So we've adopted that. We had a whole group of employers that are working with us in Dallas, and we said, here's the model. What, what do you want to tweak? And 98% they said, yeah, this mm. is it. It saved tons of time, tons of money. They agreed on the competency. So now we match the training and the skills to that competency. So, so the work we're doing is definitely driven by industrial organizational psychologists, making sure it's EEOC, so EEOC compliant, and then getting employers to agree to hire around a common framework. They aren't going to give up their secret sauce, which is, OK, we have this secret training. That, <laughs> and we say, that's great. You don't have to share that. Keep that to yourself. So it's a given, it's, it's pushing, yeah. sometimes it's pushing back to really get it defined. Yeah. Phil, because uh, like Peter's operation, you're so dependent on this connection to the employer. How do you guys go about it? You mentioned trying to burst the bubble of what you could get in 2009 versus today. How do you, how do you go about that? Well, in, in our business, there's sort of stages. There's literally a project that needs to be done. It's going to start on May 1st, and it's going to end on August 1st, and that's it. Come in, do this job, and then leave. So we don't get a lot of sort of in the psychological part of what you're looking for. But the thing that's become very popular is temp to hire. As I said, it was 42% last time we checked. I think it could easily be up in the 50s by now. And after this, I'm going to go back and have our, our staff check on it. Because <laughs> temp to hire is try before you buy, yeah. right? Yeah. On both sides. Now remember, mm -hmm. the worker is trying before they're buying mm -hmm. also. Right. I think that's a very good, good point because in this labor market, the quit rate 
um, is, is holding fairly steady, and that is up significantly from the recession. Mm -hmm. So people are feeling more confident mm -hmm. about changing. But They're feeling more confident to quit a job without one to go to, but they are getting job offers again and leaving jobs. And we have a search division, so we do a lot of stealing of really good people. <laughs> and Tonomi is not a good thing if you're an HR person and you have good people at your company, because I meet them. <laughs> <laughs> um, and how many of my staff have you stolen? Yeah. I got my own four of them. Some are in the room, but that's OK. Um, so, but he's on your he's on your board, yeah. Peter. He's on your so board. I meet more There's and more. There's a term limit. Yeah. <laughs> Problem is, he's a customer too. So you know, you don't steal from a customer. I think he gave that one order just to keep me away from the staff. But there he you didn't go. know that. <laughs> but we digress, which the three of us have never done no. ever before. <laughs> but then the when we finally coax out of when it's a six, our specialty is long term order. It's three months to a year is what we don't do. Twenty people for a day. But when, when they ask for somebody for six months, then we really have to dig into, is this a potential hire? And typically, it's, if this contract takes off that they're going to be working on, we're going to want to hire all 20 people that you have out there working on this contract. So then we get into, where would you want them to be in two years? And what skill sets do you see out there in two years? Because we want to send them people that can stay with them mm -hmm. and that they hire them. Because in our business, temporary help, the highest compliment is your customer hiring your temporary away from you. Yeah. So that's what we do is sort of ask where they're going to be in a couple of years, which we think is important. But I saw some quizzical faces. Let me just follow up on Jamay's comment about retail. And you think, well, retail, I mean, really, that's sort of like the low. Think about retail jobs and, and the amount, the career ladder that you can go from not working ever or not working for six months of long-term unemployed, or not working for 10 years, and jump back into retail with minimal training. Mm -hmm. But from an employer's point of view, you're starting to build your resume with the essential skills that we sort of start with. Customer service, talking to strangers, teamwork, sales, thinking on your feet. Mm -hmm. And we want to get them into retail jobs or um, Restaurant jobs or hotel jobs. I mean, if, if you heard mm -hmm. the, the presentation at lunch today from the CEO of, of Hyatt, is exactly what we're talking about. With the idea of them moving up very quickly. It's kind of the, the, I don't want to say it's the hidden skills, Phil, but all of us know when we go to a, a retail store or we check into a hotel or we go to a restaurant, we all in, intuitively know when we have that experience mm -hmm. what's a good experience, and yet it seems like we kind of bypass the, the, the training of that. But what I hear you say is retail is a pretty good grounding to learn those skills. It is, I mean, and the, the flip of that is we all know people we've met and said, I would hire her to do any job in my company because of the personality and the, and the energy that comes across, right? And so we want people like that. Mm -hmm. We hire for attitude, we train for skills. Mm -hmm. And so we want people that come to us, those retail hotel desk clerks, the bellhop, the, you know, that you go, here's my card. You belong in my company. And I'll worry about where later. Mm -hmm. no, so those, that's a skill that. set we need to not overlook when we look at, do you have a certificate to do this? Do you have a degree to do that? And we're going to get into this later because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a strong believer not all of us need a four-year college education the second we get out of high school. Mm -hmm. But I digress. <laughs> J Jamea and I were just exchanging notes. Neither, no one's ever said that to us. I've never to, had to somebody us. offer me a job. Okay, would, well then I'm gonna take the no, 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 I mean, Absolutely <laughs> everybody. <laughs> I, Peter, how many, um, at, at great risk of asking you some, some stats, how many people walk into your career center in the course of, uh, I don't know, a month or a year? Uh, before I answer that, it's uh, the essential skills. We have a poster board over here. I'll ask my coworker Will this show in a little bit, but it. it's it's interesting because around the retail work, uh, yeah, this we did this and we have this distributed around the schools around our region. So we're trying to bridge this with education. Oh, you are a great poster board. I was just going to say, right? see, I have oh, skill. Amazing. I have and skill. Talk with a pen in his mouth. <laughs> so this is uh, put that on your resume. <laughs> being the theme of GSV and, and education and, and the. The collaboration with the education um, world. We we did our studies with our community college district and with UCSD as a partner as well. 
identified our five priority sectors, this being one of them, and then took it further. I, I won't put you through any more. Okay. Thank right. you, guys. Just, <laughs> but but we, six more coming. Yeah, we created uh, these boards, put them in the schools, and that's been a huge, yeah. um, that's been a grand slam for us in order to really deeply integrate workforce work uh, with a K through uh, 14. And it's been amazing because now young adults and job seekers of all ages have this uh, awareness of what is in the region and starts the conversation. So more to come, but we're working really aggressively around doing much, much more in the education space because in the end, education leads to the jobs and we have to prepare our our job seekers of all ages for what, what is going on. Around uh, the matter of essential skills too, it's amazing because Phil was a retail worker as one of his uh, early, early jobs and it just shows how much you can overcome if you don't have essential skills. <laughs> you still, yeah, I'm sorry, I just had to do that. But. I still make the mortgage every month. It's questionable. But, but I think that point is really critical because if you're doing customer service skills, hospitality, all of this work, it ingrains that uh, skill set that is so essential to getting the job, to keeping the job, to interviewing well, and then once you get in there, your pathway through. So uh, we'll be a broken record about that. You know how important it is, but the more we can imbue that with young adults uh, through summer jobs and, and so much more, those skills uh, are, the, are the glue that really lead to great careers. And the more we can do that through competency-based um, training and certi certifications, it's gonna really make a, a huge difference. And not enough of that is taught in, in any educational capacity. But around the question, <laughs> the, I mean, about 15,000 to 20,000 individuals go through our career center network, our 16 locations in the county. And that foot traffic is in the neighborhood of about 150,000 people annually. So people keep coming back, taking resume, uh, writing skills, interviewing skills, uh, general computer skills and, and whatever else we can offer within the centers uh, in order to support workers wherever they are, whether they've been dislocated or they're just looking for a new career because they're coming to an end or they just want to move on to something uh, new and different. I want to come back um, and start talking about where have these these skill sets gone in, in terms of em employer demand. I mean, I, I come from a city, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where uh, on the south side, if you could walk down the hill and, and manage to get into the steel plant, chances are you were hired. Nobody asked you about a high school diploma. That's not the case in, in, in Pittsburgh today. Peter, what are you, just come down through, what are you seeing in terms of this, I don't know whether you want to call it escalating skill demand, or are you seeing the skill sets demanded change? Are you seeing the skill sets of individuals come in change? Wow, it's a great question because it's all of the, it's from the, the hard technical skills and the knowledge base to, again, the essential skills. And I think what we're seeing with uh, a gap in the essential skills, the soft skills, are, are, is due to this youth unemployment crisis we're seeing because of uh, fewer federal resources in order to support local uh, workforce boards and other entities to do uh, deep work with uh, youth uh, employment. When, you have that work at that formative stage in your life, you, you learn through the experience and the osmosis. If you don't have that, uh, that gap, um, I think, exacerbates over time. So I think we have to do more, and thank goodness Department of Labor is doing more in that space, and more cities and counties and the private sector is doing more. But in our region, uh, we've re-begun once those dollars ended through the Recovery Act and the end of subsidized wages through Department of Labor, but we have a long way to go. We're serving uh, maybe close to 1,000 uh, youth through jobs, but we have about 50,000 disconnected youth in our region alone. That's a massive gap, and we've got to do more. And if they don't get that experience of working, having a, a tough experience with a customer and a boss, and just living through that, they're not uh, acquiring these skills. And then when it comes to the technical skills, that's a, a whole other um, mountain to climb. But the more we can get people into the, into the workforce um, in whatever capacity, then off they go. But it, with the disconnected youth crisis we have, uh, and it's been talked about in, in the uh, summit and in different capacities, but we have to do so much more. It's got to be a national call to action and a crisis that we've mm -hmm. got to fix or we've got so many um, bigger problems down the road. And I'm guessing that... If I ask, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but mm -hmm. I'm guessing more than one of us learned a lesson when we were told we didn't need to come back tomorrow. Mm -hmm. 
right? Mm -hmm. first, first job, we had to learn how, what it meant to work. <laughs> Phil, how are you seeing, I guess, I don't want to make the assumption that, that the skill demand is rising or the demand for a skilled worker is rising, but I'm going to ask you, is it, and where are you seeing that? Is it just, Peter mentioned, technology skills? Is it just the tech skills, or are we looking at this press for higher skilled workers across the, the spectrum? Well, we're seeing, we're seeing employers finally willing to reopen their training department. Again. I, Mm -hmm. Great point. For a long time, us employers trained our own employees, right? We, we got somebody that was good and excited and had, hopefully had the essential skills. Mm -hmm. And then we said, okay, we'll train them. Remember the old executive training program where you got out of college and at IBM for two years, you went in the finance department, the marketing department, and, the, and, and young people can say, well, who, what companies have an executive training program? That went away at such a huge expense that it just disappeared. And for the corporate world out there, it is so competitive these days. And you know the Mark Zuckerbergs who are now 30 billionaires. That is so rare. You look at somebody that's running a business and they're, they're fighting every day to stay in business. Everybody is their competitor around the world. So the ability to have a team of 20 trainers that teach people how to do your business has actually gone away. So therefore, the expectation has to be you have to have the skills when you get to me. Now, I'll teach you how to use my software because it's intrinsic to my company, but I expect you to hit the ground running. This is one of the sort of challenges in the temporary help business. I'm hiring you to arrive with the exact skills I need not to take two weeks to learn how to do the business, but there's the computer, there's the project that needs to be done, start doing it. Mm -hmm. And companies are finding that harder and harder to find. So now they're starting to train again. A real quick note, if I may, just a super quick story around a One local time. issue. Real, real quick. <laughs> um, craft brew is huge in our region. We have a company, Stone Brewing, that now employs like up to a thousand people. We had a luncheon with um, Greg Cook, the co-founder of it, and it was all about workforce development and uh, how do you find skilled workers? It's really tough because it's a really unique thing and there's training programs that are coming along. And, but he said, uh, to what Phil said earlier about hiring for attitude, uh, he says, I don't care if they're skilled. If they just are good with customers and they're responsive and they're, they're they've got these soft skills, um, I'll hire them and I'll train, I'll take care of the rest. So and I think it really speaks to that point because in a region like this with so many um, semi-skilled, low-skilled or even uh, high-skilled positions, it's the same thing. If you've got these, these bedrock issues, then you're gonna go far. Well, I want to. Jamea, I want to. I want to come back that. and ask you because yeah. you do Susan, a lot of. This my question. A lot of work. <laughs> well, it started as your question. We're teaming up on you. Okay, well. we hear that, but that is like I'm not going to cuss, but that is like. <laughs> that's good because we're recording. That's yeah. like yeah. I mean, I hate employers that say, "Oh, you just give me somebody who'll show up in time, and then and then I'll teach them the rest." They don't do that. They won't hire anybody based on these foundational skills. Mm -hmm. So maybe yours will. That's mm -hmm. great. Could Let's be the industry. I mean, because craft brew, you're working with yeah. customers and tanks and cleaning. And beer. Yeah, but, but it's a start. Yeah, and beer. No, I mean, so I'm with you, but I'm just complaining. Mm -hmm. Because we hear that, and then the employer says, but they need four years of experience and a three-year degree. You know, I mean, so I think our belief is that we're working entry to mid-skill. We aren't focusing on, you know, engineers and, mm -hmm. you know, you're working on a lot of high-skilled jobs, Phil. We believe that if the employer will truly assess for these skills, cognitive and non-cognitive, you can assess for most of these essential skills. I believe that, that the disconnected youth and the um, low-income population is being left out because there is no way to assess for these skills. I believe, we know through our work that we have found many disconnected youth that have high skills that the employer would never have looked at before. So what we're focusing on is the 60%, if you have a pyramid, 60% of those skills are core cognitive, non-cognitive skills transferable across every industry. 
Now, they don't want to admit that. IT doesn't want to say that retail have the same skills, but customer service is customer service mm -hmm. is customer service. I've, I've waited tables, and the same customer service I learned delivering sausage stuffed mushrooms at steak and ale <laughs> works with me working with Phil. I mean, I really believe customer service is customer service. So what we're trying to do with employers is agree on these core foundational competencies of literacy, mathematics, Quapus here. Literacy with, uh, you know, English language learners is a big thing that we want to tackle because we're in Phoenix, Santa Fe, Albuquerque, Dallas, where we have a lot of ELL. So what is literacy, what is mathematics, what are these essential skills? And 90% of those are measurable. So that's where we are. So do you, do you find, Jamea, when you're talking to the employer, in a sense, they start high. We want A, B, C, D, and if we can't find it, we're not doing anything, and, and then they get realistic? Well, or do you see that bottom continue to rise? The skill demands are higher than, than they were. They continue to get higher. We're finding employers shifting, but you've got to prove the ROI, and we continue to prove the ROI. So, we, 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 we're still a big believer in cognitive ability, but most employers are measuring literacy and mathematics. You guys do. I mean, you're gonna, that's pretty much they all pay for an assessment of some sort that measures core cognitive, where employers are not hiring people that we think should be seen or the soft skills because they're doing structured interviews that knocks out anybody that has not been taught mm -hmm. how, how to, to interview. interview with a structured interview, mm -hmm. which I think I would flunk, mm -hmm. most likely. I could well, counsel you and get you through. Okay. That's right. And so and if I you think you call the before midnight tonight. Yeah, so I think we all continue to hear the soft skills, yeah. the essential skills are where we're failing. And I do think that is where workforce centers and workforce boards can be such an asset because they can help train to those skills because they aren't getting them in education. Mm -hmm. They aren't getting them in school. Right. Phil, let me come, come back. So we're looking at, you're doing referrals. How much testing and assessment do you do? It's um, customer based, depending on what, <laughs> What they think is important is what we test to, but we, there, like anything, there's a broad list here. There's the engineers that you need this degree and 10 years experience, because I'm gonna put you on a $12 million machine, and I want you to know how to work it, right? That, that's a serious, the, the population, so that's most of my business. You know, I, I want a programmer that can start programming on day one, not mm -hmm. take three months to go take some classes. I'll teach them the Qualcomm way of doing it, but you gotta know how to do it. The engineers, the IT, they're taking care of themselves. They're the job hoppers, they're moving around, they're going from 75 to 100 an hour to 150 an hour. That, the struggling entry levels where my volunteer work is involved and what these guys work on. And the roadblock is that interview. Mm -hmm. Because all these things we're talking about, let me go back. You've met people that within, literally, as human beings, we make our first impression up in three to five seconds. You've met people within three seconds. If I had a job opening, I'd hire her right now. Within seconds, I know that's somebody I want to work with, would energize the team, and would really help our company move up. But the people we want to work with and need to work with aren't those people. And they sit down, if we get them an interview or we get them to a job fair, mm -hmm. they do terribly. And, and I don't need to list all the things they don't do, but I think this essential mm -hmm. skill board will show okay. you what they need to do. Mm -hmm. So I worry less about teaching them to be um, an electronic solderer. We've got a training program at our mile from here where they're working in microscope soldering. Sounds like the most awful job in the world, and it pays eleven dollars an hour. It's just like, and we have lines of people wanting to do it. But the roadblock is that interview, and being able to speak clearly, wherever you're from. <clears throat> but getting back to this retail, which is really, I mean, if we peel it back, it's customer service, which are in a restaurant, a hotel, or um, a retail job, right? It's customer service. Mm -hmm. Well, you have to be able to communicate. You have to 
answer questions succinctly. You have to be able to talk about your experience. And you have to have built a resume. Mm -hmm. And that's why these entry level um, mm -hmm. customer service call centers is another example yeah. that's coming back to the United States. It's huge. Um, that's what we need to get people into because you can move up quickly. And job number two, you can move up quickly in that hotel, in that restaurant. But also, when you go to companies like me and I see that you've been a waitress and people go, well, I'm ashamed to be a waitress, that is a huge plus. I, you live off tips. That's a really good point. <laughs> huge plus. Phil, so looking at the job seeker, so lots of, as Peter mentioned, lots of these entry level, I use BWI Airport a lot. The last time I went up to BWI, I tagged my own bag. I, I walked over to a kiosk and I mm -hmm. told him what flight I was on and out came the thing and I did it. So there's now nobody there who does that. And so you roll your bag. That was a right. new so, pathway for yeah, you. Yeah, so how yeah. does how does the worker, how does an average let's talk about young people or somebody coming back into the market, how well do we help them understand what's going on in the market? The interviewing skills, the the soft how well do we do that? Well I think the 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 sort of unfortunate thing about our business is we weed through these people yep. and say, don't call us, we'll call you, and, you, and we won't call. Yep. I mean, part of the game is the going into our database, right? That's the big black hole that you never hear from again, yep. right? That's my way of saying, oh, sure, apply. But do you send them to <coughs> Peter? No. Oh, do we send it? Oh, yeah. me personally? I'd no. like to do that. Here's no. Peter's phone. I mean, <laughs> I mean, do you tell We, we can do that at the bottom of the was, screen. I we can taking, put Peter's cell phone long. number. I took that a little too late. <coughs> yes. I, okay. So because they, when people right. come into our right. office yeah. to apply, which we discourage because we want to do it all online because yeah. of technology and there's that database that we filter, we have a handout because the thing that we're saying, well, we don't have anything for you, and we can tell like that is how they approach our receptionist, whether they would represent manpower well or not. Don't get me started on piercings, tattoos. Oh okay, let's well, no, let's stuff. start with piercings. <laughs> okay, because <laughs> dead end road. But we do leave them with a handout to say the career centers are here. Here are competitors of ours mm -hmm. that do hire your skill set or lack thereof, so that they do have something to leave. And we do send them to the career center, whether they show up or not. I don't know. Jamee, you you do a lot of work in this space with a lot of organizations trying to work with particularly young people who don't have a credential. How much in your experience do they know about what's going on in the market and how well do we prepare people for the, for the labor market? Well, and I, I mean, I'm not the expert. Peter and Patricia are the experts, but we rely heavily for, on our workforce centers. In Albuquerque, our office is in the web. We have a huge hire pair happening with the Rockefeller Foundation um, where we have 20 employers that have agreed to hire on the spot disconnected youth because they're going through the training, which includes a customer service training. And we and they're taking assessments that show they have cognitive ability. And we've told these employers, these are going to be skilled youth ready for the hire. We're gonna do an ROI study, we're gonna track it, but we work really hard in this. I think that I'm such a believer in what the WIBS and, and, and the new WIOA Act, or whatever you guys call that thing, that WIOA. The federal legislation, <laughs> yes. Um, I, I think that the, we continue to say that is the, the linchpin of every city. And, and so we're relying heavily on believing that that's where you aggregate the resources and we're, we're leveraging that. I feel guilty sometimes on how much Linda works in Dallas with us and how much Albuquerque works with us. But, it, but it's a partnership that says, let's do this together. Let's really try to find the youth, get them the skills, get them the training, get the employers to hire them. And we have employers saying, yes, I'll hire 350, Lowe's said, we got six stores, we'll hire 350 people. Now, I hope they're good, but we believe that through the training that we're doing with the web, they're gonna be good. So that's the kind of work we're doing. 
Peter, 150,000 people. What's your sense of, of how many of them really understand what's going on in the market? How much counseling do you guys have to do to get people to understand what competitive means? Yeah, Phil's point about that being the roadblock, the interview skill is um, so true. And even there's earlier roadblocks of bad resume, bad cover letter. You don't even get to the interview. So that's part of what we can offer through the, the Career Center Network, the America's Job Centers um, throughout the country. Two, how many locations are there? Two, about 2,500. 2,500. Uh, it's an amazing network and really well integrated and, and many services that are wonderful if people will access them. But the more we can pull people in in order to access them and bring them back. And one of our challenges is just about making that experience as quality as it can be. And we're all evolving and growing in that. We don't want it to be a complicated experience, but in some cases it really is. And that can turn people off who are having a hard time navigating. Um, multiple services that they may have to access, but once they access the the centers, they're they're free. It's the it's the public dollar, and then um, if they uh, have the motivation to really follow through and to take these courses on refining the, the the three elements, you know, the cover letter, resume, and interview, that will get them so much further along the line. And and I think the reality test comes through too because people, uh, we all have blind spots and especially when we're interviewing every single one of us, we're doing something that we don't know, uh, case in point. And if you, Exception. if you get that feedback, you're going to get, you're going to get employed, but it takes that uh, professional feedback to get you there. And I guess for, for those who, who you work with and understand where is the market, where are they relative to the, to the market, mm -hmm. I'm assuming that they're looking for that upskill experience. Mm -hmm. Phil mentioned the employer is looking for today that the job seeker is looking for today, right? I mean, right. how do I get that certification? Where can I get it? How quickly can I get it? Um, yeah, and it's such uh, an array of customers who come through, some who desperately need to get that job right now, and they, they don't have an interest or don't have the time right now or in their, their life to go through a long training program for the hope of getting a job that can pay them 20 to 30 or 50 percent more. But we have to serve people where they are, but also provide the encouragement that, yes, we can get a job back where you were or in this industry. But if you want to go down this path, uh, here are the opportunities. Here's uh, an individual training account that we can provide to help you offset the cost of the training and help them along their way. That's our job through uh, our professionals to be able to provide that advice to, uh, again, help them even navigate back to the community college uh, system or higher ed, whatever the pathway may be, that's, that's our job. Are you finding the job seekers asking you more often around, um, we hear about certifications, we hear about mm. competencies, badges. 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 Are you finding, the, the, in your case, the consumers asking you more often? then they are asking about a longer term, how do I get a degree? Yes, I think that awareness is coming through more and more because it starts with our staff even understanding that these are other pathways to get to mm -hmm. um, a better career um, more efficiently and, and, and better time. And the more we can inform them and, and at the same time, then they're, it's this awareness gap again. Uh, they're not aware of the sectors of the, um, the pathways. They're also just not aware of, yeah, I could um, take a course and get a badge, a certification in a particular thing, whatever it may be, from tech to um, soldering, and be ready to go. Because then that can fill out my resume and show the employer that I am qualified to get to the, get, to be considered for the job. But again, it comes back to what Phil said. We see it all the time. Even in the people who apply for professional jobs with us, I, I would say 90% interview really badly. And if they got that feedback um, just on that level, they're going to move to the top of the list and they're going to be those that get uh, through. But if you, have, if you don't have that skill, if you haven't refined it and practiced it, all the technical skill uh, and all of the unknown soft skill can go to waste because they can't represent themselves well. Phil, I, I want to follow up and, and ask you, do you see employers willing to look at beyond uh, uh, the, the degree, which is a proxy for whatever in their mind, are, you, are they willing to do that? Is that something you can talk to them about? It, it, it's a mixed message about this, <coughs> um, having credentials or certificates. We find that we don't get calls from, from companies saying, and they must have a XYZ credential. <laughs> they don't know what they, the employer, 
I care can they do the job, and I care more about reference checks than certificates. I think a certificate is more empowering to the employee that says, I can do this, I've got the skills. Builds and, the confidence. And builds the confidence, and that comes through in the interview. Because remember, if you need experience, well, I've got a certificate, but I have no experience. And that's, that's that whole challenge of how do I get experience if you won't hire me to give it to me. So that's where that interview, again, comes in very important to sell yourself. And, and your references are the trainer that said, this is one of the best kids I've ever trained, and sell it that way to get that experience. So I think that's important mm -hmm. to understand what credentials mean to the employer, but what they can mean mm -hmm. to the employee. Mm -hmm. But if we get a chance, my worry, we, we've talked about things that Jermaine and organization and Peter are doing on the, the entry level, young people, 20s, 30s, going back in the job market, how they're helping in them in the 10, 12, 15 an hour jobs, right? To get back into the workforce and start building a resume. My heart goes out to the middle class people, the people that used to be middle management, that were making 50 to 75,000 a year. And I, I use the example of uh, bank branch managers, right? There are so many fewer bank branch managers. There's so many fewer mm -hmm. middle management. And they may have a, very well have a college mm -hmm. degree, but they very much have 10, 20, 30 years of experience mm -hmm. in an industry that has gone away. Mm -hmm. And through no fault of a merger or a acquisition or whatever, went out of business. How do we help them? Mm -hmm. It is so hard at 55 to say, I'm going to stop being a branch manager of a bank and I'm going to be an IT programmer. Yeah. I think that's one that, of the takeaways. That's the frustration. And I, mm -hmm. I assume you're interested in this topic if you're here in the audience. And we have, if we have q and I'd love to hear right. how we help people <coughs> that with that. Because that worries me. That's uh, the high educated are taken care of, and great people like this are helping the, but they have to meet us halfway, but they're helping those people. It's the middle management I worry. I did want to pause and ask if there were any, any questions. Um, I think we have a mic, or if you have a loud enough voice, you can just shout it out. Got a question right here. I'm fairly loud, so. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! You should have been on the panel. That's yeah. not okay. um, I'd like to start by asking Peter um, oh, for the recording. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, the lead into my question is, how big is your wait list, uh. notwithstanding the number of people you're serving? Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of us are aware that um, the WIBs are subject to WIOA funding that's been steadily decreasing over the last decade, mm -hmm. leaving a lot more people underserved. Mm -hmm. um, but that leads me to my <laughs> question for the panel as a whole. Um, you've talked a lot about people getting jobs, uh, but I didn't hear much mention except for once about ABE and the, found, the true foundational skills. Um, you know, the high school dropout rate, thankfully, on the whole has dropped to about 7 plus, but for Latinos, it's about 12 percent. There's 25 million limited English proficient in this country of working age. How are these folks getting into uh, moving ahead towards landing even entry-level jobs, mm -hmm. uh, notwithstanding their inability to interview for higher order jobs where they might be customer facing. What is I think, let me, let me overlay that education. with. Adult, adult basic, basic education. Yeah. Let me overlay that with, with just a kind of a secondary part of the question. So as the, as the public monies retreat, what do you see, do you see the employer Phil, you mentioned some of those programs are back. Do you see the employer coming back into this space? And what do you think is the role of the employer in this space? Mm -hmm. the, the gap I between where say, people are and where they need I to be. I just want to say one thing, and then I don't have to talk anymore. <laughs> yeah, right. None of this is going to work without technology solutions. So, you know, we had a meeting yesterday with a lot of the, um, the leading WIBs. Technology is going to be a key solver in this. People are not going to walk into the workforce center 
as a if young people are just not they're living on mobile devices so technology is going to be key i do think you can some of the solutions that we're working on for a foundation will have help that branch manager navigate to it because they'll know what skills they got from being a bank branch manager and those will relate to what skills they need for it so we're working on some of those technology solutions for mid-skill um, on abe we, we aren't working in ABE. It's a huge issue, and um, you know I think there's a lot of folks working on that. I'm mm -hmm. sure, Peter, you're doing a lot of work To some there. extent, and with the community yeah. colleges as well. Um, it's a crucial issue. Yeah. Without having the proper uh, level of competency, uh, that's the, the biggest barrier of all, and more and more just needs to be done. Uh, around wait lists, we kind of see it in terms of how long the person is waiting period to get employed, and and the long-term unemployment issue is still uh, a crisis. It's come down a lot from where it was at its peak and the, the abnormal gap that there was. Um, when you look back at trends over time, it's come down a lot, but um, so far to go because those who are still suffering through a very long gap in employment, it's not gotten any easier when you have that, that huge gap in your resume. Talk about another barrier and to overcome that. And, and, and there's been some uh, national funds in order to target that through the platform to employment approach and we've been a recipient of some of those dollars so there's a great need there still um, what else uh, do you do you see and I guess Phil you brought up employers are starting to put some of this work-based learning back in internships apprenticeships do you see employers more willing to to invest in that do they understand that Maybe that talent pool isn't as rich as they need it to be? Yeah, it's, it's very much around a specific mm -hmm. skill set. And I use the example of these electronic uh, solderers. This company has a contract to do this specific thing, and they need, from us, they need us to train 20 electronic assemblers a month for them to hire for the next three years. And they've planned that out and they know what their need is because they know there's not enough of that skill set out in the market. Mm -hmm. They tried it. And so they, first of all, they gave us the order. We couldn't find anybody. So we said, we're going to have to manufacture these people or you're not going to get your product finished and out. Mm -hmm. But back to your comment, the thing that worries me most about somebody dropping out of high school and, and adult uh, community college, whatever, call it in your market, from an employer's point of view, is they're quitters and they're losers. High school was challenging and how did they react to that? We heard about grit today. Mm -hmm. Well, they had the opposite of grit. They quit and they walked away. And I'm going to see that. So I'm going to give them a project to do. And if they're not excited or enthused or they get the least bit bored, or get distracted, they're gonna quit it. And that's not the kind of person I'm gonna hire. I tell people, if you're gonna start on your AA degree, focus on finishing it. Because if you go halfway through, or you tell me I took five courses and then quit, you're a quitter. And a quitter to me is a loser, and I'm not going to hire. You lost value by starting something and dropping out than if you had never started it. And those are the things the population needs to hear that HR thinks. And when you think about it, it's a logical assumption. This is gonna be the hardest part of the whole thing. You got like 30 seconds. Yeah. It's 2016, we're going to somehow, after billions of dollars, we're gonna elect a new president. <laughs> He or she is going to walk into the White House January 2017. You got 30 seconds. What are you telling them to focus on? <laughs> You're asking him first. No, go. I want to, to focus on. Oh boy. Education and workforce world. Who wants to jump in? Uh, I, I maybe uh, in reflecting on some of what Jim Collins said. I mean, the, we need a, that BHAG for the country too, and to be able to focus on on the worker and the learner have uh, a, a really audacious goal here that focuses on opportunity for all. We hear it through Department of Labor, but how do we manifest that uh, in the country so that that's our moonshot? It's not the moon now, it's, it's our, our population. So access. Phil? 
I'll spend my 30 seconds. I want um, the every level of government to train people that are have a job or are out of a job that it is their responsibility to take care of themselves. Don't blame divorce, don't blame mother of the drug, don't blame I move too much. Own the situation you're in and do something about it. There is lots of help out there. If somebody said to me, pull up your big girl panties and get out there and do it. Jamee? So I think the last few administrations have had way too much, on, way too much focus on a four-year degree. I think it's about skills and competencies and training and employment. And the cost of four-year education is unaffordable for most Americans. And I think they should quit talking about it. <laughs> Jamee Bliven, Innovate, Educate, Phil Blair, Manpower, Peter Kallstrom, San Diego Workforce Partnership. Thank you for joining us. I'm Ron Painter, and I want to say thank you to ASU and GSV for making workforce development a part of the forum this year. And we hope that um, we were able to fill in some information for you, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you.